Welcome back to Computer Science 3,269.80. Today is the day we talk about Assignment 2, the notorious Assignment 2. Um, so Assignment 1 is due tonight for anyone watching this on the 28th of September. Um, and Assignment 2 will be, uh, it's not uploaded yet. So if you try to download Assignment 2 live right now as I'm recording this, um, it probably won't be up, but at some point around midnight tonight, that assignment will be there. So if you click on Assignment 2 link tomorrow morning, um, it'll be there for you to download. So I'm just preparing the last little bit of it, um, which takes some time. So today, we're going over all about Assignment 2. You will have 16 days to work on Assignment 2. So there's quite a bit of time to work on it. And trust me when I say that you will need every bit of that time. Um, I'm So Assignment 2 is going to be a lot of work, but it's not meaningless work. It's, it's truly something I believe that you will take forward and use this knowledge in a lot of your programming for the rest of your programming careers. So please try and, and put um, more effort into assignment two than, than a normal assignment. You will have more time for it and it's also worth more marks. So that's just wanted to say that out of the gate that um, assignment two is gonna be pretty important. So let's jump into it. And there's a lot of slides to go over. And just before I get started with it, um, I completely understand that in the first watching of this, there's going to be a lot of information. It's going to seem pretty scary at first, and it's going to seem like it's too much work. But trust me, as soon as you start working on it, and you start like doing part one, part two, part three, part four, like all these little sub functions, and you start to get those working, it really does come together in a cohesive fashion. However, if your JavaScript is still a little bit weak, um, or like your, uh, comfortability, your comfortableness, if that's a word, with using two-dimensional arrays is a little bit weak, then you may struggle a little bit with some of the implementation side of things for this assignment. Conceptually, I don't think it's too complex, but there's some moving parts um, to this assignment. So what we'll do is I'll go over all of the slides for assignment two, and then I'll open up the code for assignment two that you have to implement, and I'll go through all of that in the second half of the lecture. So there's gonna be a lot more explanation for this assignment than there was for assignment one, and that's just because there's more stuff to do. So what is new in assignment two? Well, it's actually going to be the exact same interface. So it's the same sort of um, GUI that's there that you interact with in the exact same way, it's the same skeleton code structure. So you have this search student class, the same search iteration function, the same start search function. So assignment one was really just to get you up to speed with that architecture so that assignment two, um, you can focus on the algorithms instead of like the headache of learning that architecture. But the new things, um, well, one is that we'll be implementing the A star algorithm. And as you saw from last time, it's not actually that different from breadth first search. The only difference, again, between A star and breadth first search is which node you pick from the open list. That's all, right? So this actually implementing the A star algorithm, that's going to be the easiest part of this assignment, okay? Because you've already done BFS and it's only a couple of lines to change to turn BFS into A star. New in this assignment is going to be multiple object sizes. And I have slides on all of this, but we're going to be dealing with objects of size one. So that's what we did in assignment one. But now we'll have a two by two and a three by three object as well. And we'll see how that affects things. We'll be incorporating eight directional movement in our assignment. So now we have um, diagonal movements and those diagonal movements are going to have different costs. Um, and we'll see how that affects things. We are going to have heuristic functions to form our H of N for the A star algorithm. We're going to have connected sectors. So we'll talk about um, connectivity in this assignment. And don't worry, it's a bit of a com, you know, it, it's a long word, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy intuitively. Um, and we'll talk about pre-computing 
and optimization as well. So first of all, there's the A star algorithm. So what does that look like? Well, here's the A star algorithm that we saw last time. Let's go over it once more so it's fresh in your mind. So we have this function A star. And again, this is an instance of the graph search. So it uses the closed list. So what we do is we set up our closed list here. That's going to be a list of states that we've already expanded. Then we have an open list and the initial state, like the root node is pushed into the open list. Um, so the open list can be implemented in a, a many different ways for A star. Um, here, we just have a simple list or a vector of nodes. You could have a priority queue um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But essentially, it's just some connection, collection of nodes that we have to get from. And then the rest of the algorithm is exactly the same as BFS, except one line, line six here, which is when we want to select a node from the open list, when we did BFS, we chose the first node in the open list. However, for A star, what we do is we remove the node from the open list that has the minimum F value. So you might go through and you may write a function called remove min f. And what you do is you just loop through the open list. You find the node that has the minimum f value and you return it. Okay. And you remove it as well from the open list. Everything else here is the same as what you have already implemented in assignment two or assignment one. Sorry. So really the only difference here is how you select the node. And I think that's really cool how, how now we've learned why A star is so similar to the other search algorithms that we've seen. Okay, so for assignment two, as a little treat, <laughs> I'm basically going to give you the pseudocode. Now this looks a lot like JavaScript, but I've modified it a little bit just to fit on the slide. Um, this is going to be your search iteration function. Okay, so the first thing in your search iteration function, well, you already know this. This should have been like what you're doing in assignment one. Um, and I guess if you haven't finished assignment one yet, you could actually use this <laughs> as part of assignment one. Or, or you could use this as a hint from where you may be going wrong with assignment one. So if the search isn't in progress, return, right? Because we're not currently doing anything. We've finished the previous search. If the open list is empty. Now keep in mind that in order to fit stuff on the slide, it should be this dot open, right? And dot empty is not actually a thing. So this is a little bit of pseudo code, but you can implement that in JavaScript really easily, right? So this dot in progress, again, it's just this dot instead of in progress. Uh, so you set in progress equal to false you have a negative one cost and you return, right? So that means that if we have searched the entire open list and we haven't found a solution, then we set our cost to negative one and that's it, we're done. Then what we do is instead of just getting the first thing from the open list, we are, we're gonna have some function, which is just remove the minimum F valued node from the open list. So you write that function, you implement it, it returns you the node and removes it from the open list. And then it's the same thing again as, as assignment one, if the state of the node is the same as our goal, then we construct a path and set the cost based on this node. So that's where we go backwards up through the parent pointers to get back to the root node. And now we're finished the search. So we would set in progress equal to false and then we return because we're done. However, if, if it's not the goal, then we continue on with this function. So if the node's state is in the close list, um, Actually, this should be return. That's not continue. One second. There we go. So if the node state is in the closed list, we return because we can't continue because we're in a loop. That was just a typo. So that just means don't re-expand this state, the, the state of this node a second time. Um, if it wasn't in the closed list, then we continue. So we have uh, we're going to add the state of that node to the closed list. And again, I'm, I'm using some shorthand here. Then for each of the actions in this.config.actions, if it's not a legal action, then we continue. So that means go to the next action. Otherwise, if it is a legal action, um, let s equal compute next state. So get the next state from this action. 
if S is in the closed list, we can continue. We don't, if we don't need to put a new node in the open list whose state is already in the closed list. Now this, this part is new for assignment two. We have to compute the G cost of each node. So the new G cost of the child is going to be equal to the parent's G cost plus the cost of the action. Then we're going to have another function called estimate cost, and that's the heuristic function, which we're going to explain in a bit. Okay. And that estimate cost function takes in um, the current uh, states S or the, the current states X and Y value and the goal X and Y value and returns a value. Then we're going to construct the child node, right? Based on X and Y and um, the action and the parent and the new G value and the heuristic. Then we add that child to the open list. So this is like assignment one, but more. So if your assignment one has a lot more code than this, then you went around, you went about it in a kind of a, a way that was a little bit too much code, I guess. Um, I want to I want to put that nicely, but you can see how there's not a lot of actual code that that has to go in here, other than things like construct the path and is legal action and compute next state. That may be a few lines of code each. So just as a note, some function names have been shortened, and the this dot whatever has been removed just so I could fit it all on one slide. But basically, what I'm showing you is this is what your assignment twos search iteration function should look like. You just have to take the stuff here that's not literal JavaScript and convert it into JavaScript. And the reason I'm giving you this is because the A star part of assignment two is by far the least amount of work of assignment two. Okay. So in our node class, before our node has had X and Y, that was the state of the node, and it had action and it had parent. However, in this class, or sorry, in, in assignment two, we are doing a star. And so we have to keep track of two new values. One is G, that's the G cost of the node, which is the cost of the path so far to this node. And we went over what G uh, meant in the last lecture when we did our, our A star example. And H is going to be the heuristic value of the node. Now you don't technically need to compute like and store H, but it's nice to have it there so we don't need to recompute it later. So we're going to compute the heuristic value of the node and we're going to store it in the node class. And for 6980, maybe you have to store some other thing in the node class, but we'll talk about um, the grad extra work on this assignment. It's going to be the very last thing in this lecture. Alrighty. And just keep in mind that the child's G cost is equal to the parent's G cost plus the cost of the action. Okay. So those are the new things. And so let's get, uh, let's get into like the, the more fine details of the assignment. So again, we are going to have uh, our grid, which is separated into um, these, these cells. Each of those cells has X, Y values. And those are the states of our environment. They are not the nodes. Okay. I got a lot of, I still, even though I went over this for many, many minutes during the lectures, there are still people out there who just need to rewatch and sort of, um, spend a bit of time really understanding the difference between the states of the environment and the nodes in the search, because that's still a little bit of, um, confusion for some people. So these are the states of the environment. We also are going to have eight actions for this assignment. Excuse me. So our eight actions are going to be the up, down, left, and right actions that we're used to, as well as the diagonal actions of moving up, right, up, left, down, left, and down, right. And they're associated X and Y changes for those actions. And we also have, because these actions have, um, different distances, essentially, the actions are going to have different costs associated with them as well. So this is why, uh, and I mentioned this before, why we went with 100 for up, down, left, and right. So moving up, down, left, and right travel the same unit distance, and we just multiply it by 100 to get the cost um, arbitrarily. And if we want to go diagonally, we are taking essentially the square root of 1 plus 1, which is the square root of 2, which is 1.41, blah, 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 blah. And we multiply that by 100 so that our costs have uh, integer values. 
All right, so the reason for 100 and 141 is just it's a decent place to round off so we can use integer values for our costs rather than have to deal with floating point values and infinitely repeating irrational numbers. So these will be the costs associated with actions in assignment two. Okido. Legal actions. So before, um, the only real legal action criteria that we had was that if you're moving from one place to another place, up, down, left, or right, they have to be the same color. That was the only thing we said for legal actions, and they can't move off the map. But in this assignment, we have some extra criteria for legal actions. So first, we're going to have differently sized objects, and I will have diagrams for this, so don't worry that it's just in text for now. An object can only occupy a region if all of the tiles occupied by the object are the same color. An object can only move to a space if all of the new region is also the same color. And I'll, I'll show, I'll give demonstrations of this. An entire, an object must be entirely within the map. Okay, so since objects can be larger than one by one, um, you can't have part of it in the map and part of it outside the map, okay? You've got to have it all within the map. And a diagonal move cannot allow the object to jump over a tile of another color. And that's not intuitive at first, but we do have, um, I do have some uh, examples coming up. Okay, so first let's talk about object sizes. So in assignment one, we just had like one object living in a cell on the map. The agent was just occupying one of the states. However, now we're going to have three different object sizes for assignment two. So an object of size one is just like this, all right? It's, it's what you had for assignment one. But an object of size two now is going to occupy a region of the map, which is two by two. And an object of size three is going to occupy a part of the map, which is size three by three. And now that we have larger objects, the semantics of the position of an object also change, okay? So when we say the x, y location of our object or our agent, we're referring to the top left cell of the agent. So if that's a three by three agent, then the x, y location of the agent will be in the top left. So this right here where I'm circling, the, where the x is, that is the um, location of the agent. It just happens to occupy more cells. This up here, similarly, it's still the top left of a two by two. And it's, yes, it's the top left of a one by one, but a one by one only has a top left, all right? So that is the location of an object of different sizes. So just again, it's not in the middle, right? That was a bit confusing for some people last year. It's, it's not the middle of the object. It's always the top left of the object. So now we have a separate issue, which was not present in assignment one. And that's whether or not an object can actually fit in a location on the map. So here, for example, this object of size three by three can fit at this location X. And the reason it can fit at location X is because all of the tiles underneath it are blue. All of the tiles underneath it are the same color. So we need to check for that. However, if it was here, you cannot legally have the object occupy this area, okay? Because its position is here. But look, a bunch of the tiles would have blue underneath it, but some of them have green underneath it. So an object, in order to fit at a location on the map, in order for it to be legally placed there, all of the tiles have to be the same color, okay? That's really important. And you're going to be writing a function for assignment two, essentially, which is can fit or can object fit. I can't remember the exact name, which takes in the X, Y location of the top left. And it takes in the size of the object. And you essentially just have to loop over the size in the X and the size in the Y and check all of the cells and see that they're equal to the value um, of the location of the object. Okay, so that's, that's pretty intuitive. That's not so bad. Now let's talk about legal actions. And there was this additional step, 
a diagonal move cannot allow the object to jump over a tile of another color. That is going to be annoying to implement, but also a blessing for optimizations. And I know you don't know what that means yet, but you will hopefully by the end of the lecture. So what does that mean for legal actions? Well, let's say that we have an object of size one that's living right here, okay? Here are the legal actions that that object can perform. So yes, it can move up because they're both blue. It can move right, it can move down, but it can't move left. That is the same thing that we did for assignment one, right? Because it can't move left because it's a different color. It can move up, down, or right because it's the same color. It can move upright, it can go diagonally upright or diagonally downright because they're the same color. It can't go diagonally down left because it's a different color. However, the big difference here in this assignment is you cannot move up left. And the reason you can't move up left is because this tile, let me draw here what I mean. The reason you can't move up left is if you draw sort of the path the tile would take if it slid from one location to another, okay? So if this tile X slid boop, 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 up onto this tile, it would cross over a tile of a different color. And if it crosses over a tile of a different color, it's illegal. So you're going to have to implement that as well. It turns out there's a nice little optimization that you can do that we'll talk about later to implement that, but that is one thing that you have to make sure of that we cannot jump over tiles of a different color. All right. Here's an example of that when we have a two by two object, okay? So for a two by two object whose position is at X, it will occupy this area down here. This object can move to the left, that's true, because it will slide over entirely tiles of the same color. It can move down left, because again, it's not jumping over anything of different colors. It can move down because um, of the same property. It cannot move up, and it can't move up because if it did, then the top right tile would be occupying a tile of a different color. See how that works? So you can't occupy this area with a two by two object because some of the tiles would be blue and some of the tiles would be green. So you can't move up. Similarly, you can't move to the right because if you did, then the top right would be occupying a green tile here. You can't move upright because you'll be occupying different tiles, uh, tiles of a different color, but you also can't move up left or down right. And the reason for that is the same as I mentioned before. So if we draw this sort of um, path that we would have to slide, right, to get from right here to get up here, then we would be this part of the tile, right, this top right part would be sliding over this green tile. So if you think, it, if you think of legal actions as having a physical object, that you would have to slide along like a, a board game without hitting any other colors, that is a legal action, right? That's how you, how you explain this. So look at this. If we have a situation like this, where we have a, like a current or starting uh, point down here, and we have a goal up here, our object cannot move up this narrow path. And the reason it can't is because if we slid that up here, then this tile would be overlapping this green tile. And so in order to move from this starting location to this goal location, our object would have to move all the way left and then go up and then, and then go up and then come over here and then move all the way over and then go down, okay? So it wouldn't be able to slide over any tiles of the same color. However, what about this case? If we had a little bit wider of an area, it can actually get from the start, the start to the goal via this channel. However, you still can't make diagonal actions because if you slid this tile diagonally upright, then this tile would be cutting over this green tile. So let me just draw that again. So if you wanted to slide this upright, 
then the top left would be fine, but this tile here would be moving over uh, this bottom right tile. So in order to get from this start to this goal, what you could do is you could move it up, right, up, right, up, right, up, up. That would be a path that you could take to get from here to here. And it would be shorter than having to go all the way around. But the important part here being that you can get through here, but you can't do it with diagonal actions. It would have to be one wider for you to get there with diagonal actions. Okay. So here's an interesting little fact about diagonal actions that you could possibly use to optimize your computations. Look at this. So here's an example where I can go up right, I can go down right, I can't go down left because I would be jumping over it, I'd be sliding over it, and I can't go up left because it's a different color. But let me fill in the other actions, the, the up, down, left, right actions, okay? So look at this. I don't. This isn't obvious to notice. However, um, if we notice diagonal actions that are true, they are surrounded on either side by two true cardinal actions. So what does that mean? It means that up right is legal because up and right are both legal. Down right is legal because right and down are both legal. So if you think about it, within the rule set that we've made, we're basically saying that upright is a legal single action if both upright and right up would both be legal actions as well. Okay? So the reason down left is not legal is because left is not legal. So if we can't go left then down, then down left is not legal. We could go down then left, but we can't go left then down. And both of those have to be legal in order for the diagonal action to be legal. So that's a really cool property of the actions that we've seen here, is that an, a diagonal action is only legal if it is surrounded, surrounded by legal actions. Okay. And if we apply that to here, we can see that the reason upright is not legal, okay, is because going right is not legal. So if we can't go right then up, then upright is not a legal action. So that is something that you could possibly use in your code as a way of determining the legal diagonal actions. Okay, someone said, meaning after calculating the orthogonal moves, the diagonal moves are just the ending of those results. So yeah, you could think about it in that way. So if we look back um, again to say what that person was saying, if you take up and you take right and you end them together, you get the legality of upright. If you look at downright, you, if you and right and down, you get downright. If you and left and down, you get down left. And meaning they both have to be true in order to be true. So that's a good, uh, a good example. All right. So now that's action legality. So what do paths look like now that we have that sort of legal action? Well, paths are going to at first seem a little bit counterintuitive because this is not a legal path. Even though eight directional movement is legal, this path is not a legal path in assignment two. The reason it's not a legal path is because here, we are jumping over this, this green tile right here, okay? So this is not a legal path from this tile to this tile. In fact, this would be the shortest legal path from this tile to this tile or this state to this state, all right? So that's what it would look like because yes, you can use diagonal moves, but only if those diagonal moves do not um, jump over or slide over any uh, tiles of different colors. And the path cost of this path would just be the sum of the costs of each of the individual actions. So each cardinal move is 100, each diagonal move is 141. So the cost of this path would be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. So we have six cardinal movements, then a diagonal, so that's 141, 
we go to 741, then two more Cardinals, 741 plus 100, 841 plus 100, 941. So the cost of the optimal path between here and here will be 941 within the costs that we have assigned in our assignment. All right, so that's paths and path costs, and they're directly related to action legality and action costs. Let me just take a drink real quick. Now we move on to the fun stuff. <laughs> heuristic functions, the things that separate the, the heuristic search from the rest of search. So a heuristic function, if we remember from our entire lecture on heuristic functions, it's a guess at how much distance is remaining from a current location to a goal. And in assignment two, you're going to implement your heuristic functions as the estimate cost function. So the estimate cost function is going to take in a current state X and Y and a goal state GX and GY. And that's going to return your guess at how much you have to go from XY to GX, GY. And you're going to have to implement four different heuristic functions. Turns out one of them is, is like trivial, so you only have to really implement um, three, okay? So you have to implement uh, the Euclidean two-dimensional distance. So all you've got to do for that is type in Pythagoras. That's really easy. You've got to implement the cardinal Manhattan distance, and you've got to implement the diagonal Manhattan distance. So, um, I'm going to be passing into you, and you'll see this when I actually go, go over um, the code, but that there'll, there'll be an if statement, and it just says, if heuristic equals dist, you type in the Euclidean distance. If it equals card, you do four-directional Manhattan. If it equals diag, you do uh, eight-directional Manhattan distance. And again, just as a recap on what those are, here is the uh, Euclidean distance. So you are just computing like Pythagoras on the X and Y of the start and the goal. This is the Manhattan distance function, which is the L cost. So what you do for the Manhattan distance in order to calculate that is you would find the distance in the X direction and you would find the distance in the Y direction and just add those up, right? So here, for example, let, let's do that example out. So we've got a difference of one, two, three, four. So there's a difference of four in the Y direction and a distance of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 in the y direction. So a difference of 4 in the x direction, a difference of 11 in the y direction, or the x direction. So what should our heuristic be? Well, let's just have a look. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's a really easy calculation. It's just the difference in the x's plus the difference in the y's. The diagonal guess, however, is a little bit more complicated, okay? And you can see here that our diagonal guess is jumping over or sliding over tiles, and that's because it's a guess. The, the heuristic doesn't know anything about obstacles. It could go right through an obstacle, right? It's just a guess. So in order to calculate the diagonal Manhattan distance, it's just a little bit more complicated. What you have to do is you have to find the difference in the X and the difference in the Y. All right, now let me draw a little bit of a diagram here for you. Uh, this here, I'm gonna draw this, and then I'm gonna draw this rectangle over here. So I know red on blue is a little bit hard to see, but this is the difference in the Y, and this up here, or this whole value here, is the difference in the X. Right? So this, this side of the rectangle encompassing the start and the goal, that is the difference in the Y. And this down here, that's the difference in the X. But if you look closely and you realize this little optimization to computing this, what you're going to have is you're going to make diagonal movements in the shortest of these two directions and then cardinal movements for the rest of the direction. Okay, so you figure out the difference in X, you figure out the difference in Y, you take the smaller of those two, you multiply that by the diagonal cost, which is 141, then you take the larger of those two, 
subtract the smaller of the two, then take that value and multiply it by the cardinal cost. So that's how you that's how you compute the diagonal Manhattan distance. And I'm not going to give you the code because I want you to actually sit down and, and write that code for yourself. And of course, the zero heuristic is just you always return zero. And someone out there in the chat, tell me, which algorithm does A star become if the heuristic is zero? We talked about that last time. Um, which of the algorithms that we mentioned so far does A star turn into if your heuristic value is always zero? Now, let me just mention that um, implementing these heuristics can take a little bit of time, right? It shouldn't be too long. Okay, so, so everyone out there said uh, uniform cost search, which is correct. Uniform cost search has F equal G. A star has F equal G plus H. So if you set H to zero, then the A star would become F equal to G, which is uniform cost search. So great, that's a good exam question. All of you got the exam question right. Something that's cool about the zero heuristic, A, is that it's super easy to implement, but um, if you use a zero heuristic, you can test your A star and it will still provide optimal solutions, okay? So if you're running your A star with these heuristics and you're not getting optimal solutions, test it with the zero heuristic. If you test it with the zero heuristic and you get optimal solutions, if, and then you test it with your heuristics and you get non-optimal solutions, that means that there's a problem with your heuristic and not a problem with your algorithm. So you can use the zero heuristic for that. All right. Now what I want to do really quick before I go any deeper into this is I want to show the assignment. Uh, so let me load that up. Okay, so here's the assignment. Looks exactly the same as assignment one. Right. Let me toggle the grid because it's a bit harsh on the on the stream. So on assignment one, there are some extra things. Right. So here we've got uh, the student A star solution. You've got the solution A star. Then you've got some other things that I've put in here so you can like compare it to them. But essentially, you're going to be implementing the student A star. You've got legal actions that you can choose from. So, for example, if I go to solution A star, and then I come down here and I do this, that is the optimal path from this starting location to this goal location. And if you look, none of these actions are skipping over tiles, right? They all, they all obey that property where none of the actions are sliding over tiles of different colors. So that's good. But look at this. Just by selecting the different actions, now it's producing the optimal path in four directions. Okay, so this is tied to your search and your search is now able to search with different movement types just by selecting this. We can also use different heuristics. Okay, so I can use the eight directional Manhattan distance, the four directional Manhattan distance, the 2D Euclidean distance, or the zero heuristic. All right. There we go. So... Um, I see a few questions out there in the chat about um, A star. Rather than go over that, just watch the previous lecture, okay? We went all over A star. There's an hour and a half of content um, for that. So, uh, if anyone wants to play around with a similar example, I'll paste this in the chat right now. This is my search function that I have online on my website that you can play around with. So, you can just go to my website slash search. And, and you can play around with that if you want. So the other thing that's new for this assignment is the concept of connected states, okay? And if you right click on the map, it's going to color all of the states that you can legally reach from the mouse position. So if I right click right here up in the top left, oh, that's because it's the student version. Let me go to the solution version first. So if I right click up here, it shows me all of the places I can legally reach from this area. Similarly, right here shows me all the places I can legally reach from there, here, here, and I can drag this over the map. And what this pink region represents is what I'm calling a connected sector of states. They are connected 
because you can get to any of them from any of them. All right, see how that works? So the, connect the connectivity of states changes when you change the object size, right? So if I look right here, this is a path of, with an object of size three, right? It's a thicker object. This object can no longer fit through this path. So if I do the same path, but for a one by one, see how it can fit through here? For a two by two, it can fit through there, but for a three by three, it can't fit through there. And so your search should work just like this. And as I change the object sizes, your search will restart and it will do the search. However, look at this. If I right click here, uh, let me just uh, refresh, go back to solution and then come to three by three. If I right click here for connected states of size three, you see that there's some blue that's not been drawn, right? And the blue areas that you see cannot be reached from this tile. Well, for example, this one down here can't be reached because it's not legal to put an object of size three here, right? Let me show you this in a, uh, an easier to understand example. So the connected states for this three by three object are these states because I can't fit it right here, right? I can't fit it right here. And also it's not going all the way down to the bottom because the entire object has to be within the map. So I just wanted to show you what these connected states were before I go on with the slides. So let's go back to the slides now. Okie doke. So connected states. States are considered to be connected for an object of a given size if a legal path exists between them, no matter how long that path might be. And I'm calling this a connected sector is the entire set of states that are all connected to each other. So in assignment two, if you hold down the right mouse button, it's going to highlight all states that are connected to the state that you clicked on. And an important fact is that connectivity is transitive. So that means if A is connected to B and B is connected to C, then that means A is also connected to C because A could have gone from A to B and from B to C, right? So let's, let's look at a couple examples of connectivity. So here we go. These two states are obviously connected, right? A one, a size one object right here and a size one object right here, um, down here, they're connected because a path between them exists. Okay. A, B, and C here, they are all connected for size one. Why? Because they can all fit at the locations and they can all travel between those locations. However, these, these locations are not connected for size two or for size three. And you might ask, well, you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a pathway here of size two. There's a pathway here of size two. A can get to B. It looks like A can get to C. Why would they not be connected? The reason these are not connected is because remember C is at the location of this two by two or three by three object. And since it's not legal to place a three by three object right there, then obviously there can't be a path there, right? Why isn't my pen working? My laser pointer, here it is. So because C can't fit a two by two object or a three by three object, that means that A and C are not connected. However, A and B are connected for objects. Oh, sorry, no, they're not. The reason B isn't connected is because the two by two object would be going off of the screen down here. It's the top left, right? So none of these are connected because B and C can't fit. You cannot fit an object of size two or three in those locations. However, A, B, and C now, they are all connected for objects of size two, right? So here you go. Objects of size two, object of size two. A path exists between A and C a path exists between A and B. There you go. So they're all connected. But for size three, these are not connected. And the reason they're not connected for size three is because just look at this. If we draw out the three by three C up here, it can't move anywhere, right? It can exist right here because it's all the same color, but it can't actually go anywhere because if it tries to go left, it can't go there. It can't go off the map. 
It can't move right because it'll be overlapping a green tile and it can't go down because it's overlapping a green tile. So they're not connected for size three. Okay. Uh, someone asked, will it always be top left? So the location of an object always indicates the top left of an object. All right. These two places are obviously not connected because you can't path from an object of one color to an object, or from a, a tile of one color to a tile of another color. All right? So you can't do that. They're, they're not connected. They're sad. They can't be connected. So these would be, this is a connected sector for size one. So wherever you are in the green for size one, you can path to any other area within the green um, for another object of size one. Okay. So here in this example, it's pretty easy. All of these blue ones are connected, right? For size one. All of these gray ones are connected for size one. These greens are connected for size one. These greens are connected for size one, but these greens are not connected to these greens. Even though they're the same color, you can't path between them. All right. So you may say, well, I intuitively understand that, but how in the hell do I actually compute that? Because it looks like we're going to have to do pathfinding from like each no place on the map to each other place on the map. And that's going to take a long time. My paths are really slow, but it turns out that is not the case. Okay. Here's why it's not the case. And this is, I didn't come up with this. Okay. So I'm allowed to call it brilliant. Um, it's brilliant because of the no sliding over other colors thing that we set. So recall that a diagonal move is only legal if both the surrounding cardinal actions is also legal. Okay, so why does that help us? It helps us because it means that any path with diagonal moves only exists if another path with only cardinal actions also exists. So, let me just repeat that. A path that has diagonal moves in it will only be legal if a separate path that contains no diagonal actions also exists. Got that? I hope so. Therefore, cardinal connectivity is the same as diagonal contact connectivity, and it's easier to compute. So that means that if two states are connected with up, down, left, and right movements, then they're also connected with diagonal movements. All right, so let's use breadth first search. We'll, we'll use up, down, left, and right breadth first search to compute connectivity. And you might say, how can up, down, left, right connectivity explain diagonal connectivity? Well, if you're asking that question still, replay this slide and then go back and talk about where we talked about legal actions. All right, so here's how we're going to do our connectivity. And I'm going to show this, like I'm gonna show this uh, sort of visually, and then I'm going to give you the algorithm. So we're gonna go over it visually first so that you understand what's happening. And then later, we're gonna go over the algorithm so you understand like the code that you have to write because you're going to be do doing this in assignment two. So I'm gonna move my camera down here just for this slide because it's a bit bit in the way. I wanna be able to see these, these green things up here. So let's compute connectivity. What I'm going to do in order to do that is I'm going to have a separate data structure and that data structure is going to be the same size as the environment. It's gonna start out as the same size as the environment. And I'm going to fill that all with zeros, okay? And what a zero is going to represent, as we'll see when we do this in the future, a zero will mean that it's not connected to anything, okay? So let's go forward with that knowledge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the very top left of this map. I'm going to start up here, and then I'm going to iterate from left to right like this, going across, then I'm gonna come down by one and I'm gonna iterate like this, and I'm gonna iterate like this, and I'm gonna iterate like this, and I'm gonna do this for the entire map, okay? 
So this is essentially a breadth first search. Some people call it flood fill, but we'll, we'll show that. So, so this is, I'm iterating over every location. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the value at that location. So here I am, I'm starting at the location right there. I'm going to give it a new number. That number, let's just say it's one for now, okay? So I'm starting right here at this one and I'm doing a breadth first search in all four directions and every legal action that I can touch from this location, I'm setting that number equal to one if it doesn't already have a non-zero value. So for example, from here, I'm gonna look to the right, is that a legal action? And I'm gonna look down, is that a legal action? If it is, I'm going to um, change these values from zeros to ones. Just give me a second. Um, there's a bunch of people like spamming unrelated stuff in the chat. Uh, if you don't stop that, um, I'm just gonna ban you, okay? Cause just class related stuff in the chat, not self promotion or whatever. So I'm gonna look to the right. I'm gonna see, is that a zero? And is it a legal action? If it is, then I'm gonna make it a one. Okay, so now I'm at this spot where I filled out this. From each of these actions, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna look in each direction. If it's currently a zero and it's a legal action, I'm gonna spread the ones there. So I'm gonna keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this until I get to all the places that were legal actions and were also zeros, okay? And if we look, look at this. I've computed the connectivity for this cell. So everything that's a one on the map is connected to this cell that I just started from. And even stronger than that is any cell on the map which has a value of one is connected to any other cell on the map that also has a value of one. So I've computed the connectivity of all of the cells with values of one kind of in parallel without having to do each pairwise connectivity calculation. And the reason for that is because connectivity is transitive. If this one is connected to this one and this one is connected to this one, then this one is also connected to that one. See how that works? Awesome. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is let me just discard all these annotations and I'll come back. All right, so what I just did was I did this flood fill from this location. So what I do now, as I said I would before, is I'm going to start from the next location, which is one over. However, my algorithm is going to say, if that value already has a non-zero value, then I've already computed the sector, or the, the, the sector number, as I'm calling it, the, the connectivity for that value. So I've already, con I've already computed that one, so I don't need to do a flood fill from there, because I'd just be recomputing what I already did. I'm gonna go to the next one, same thing. Next one, same thing. And I'm gonna get all the way over to here where I see the next zero value, all right? So when I see the next zero value, somewhere in my algorithm, I've recorded that the last number that I wrote in was one, and I'm gonna put in the next number, which is two. So this spot right here now is going to be given the value of two, and then I'm gonna do the same algorithm from here. It's gonna check all the legal actions, Right, so this one isn't legal. This one is legal and it's a zero. So that's gonna become a two and this is gonna become a two. So I'm gonna go boom, 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 out from there and I've got all twos. So now I know that each of these twos are connected to each other two, but if they have a different number, they're not connected to these ones. So in my code now, once I've computed this thing, I can just say, if I want to know if this cell has a legal path to this cell, I just check their sector numbers. Okay, let's keep going. So I keep going from here. Uh, this one's been done, this one's been done, this one's been done. I come down here, I go all the way across. All these have been done, I go all the way across. Okay, now I get to another zero. So I assign that the next number, which is three. I fill this out with threes in the same way. Then I keep going with the algorithm. I get to over here, which is four and I compute these, which are fours. And I have given a value to everything on the map at this point. And so this is a what I'm calling a connectivity sector map or 
um, sector numbers or connected numbers, etc. And it's essentially just an extra data structure. So we've used a little bit more memory and we've done what we've called pre-computation. So before we go and do our searches, well, for example, let's say I told you to search from this location right here to this location. Well, what's something that you can do now? Would you do that search? Or would you just look up the connectivity and say, hey, the connectivity number is different. And if the connectivity numbers are different, then no path exists. So I'm not going to waste time doing a search. And some people asked me like why some of my stuff ran so fast in assignment one is because my assignment one also does this, right? So anytime there's not a path that's legal, there's not a connection between them. And so you can do that as an optimization um, beforehand to, to do that. Now, just keep in, keep in mind that this is only going to work for static maps. So if our maps changed over time, like let's say our island was growing or something like that, then we would have to recompute this every time. And that's like, it might be expensive, but for static maps that aren't changing, right? This is a very useful pre-computation. Um, all right. So computing connectivity. So here is the algorithm that we just did visually. So I just showed the example, here's the algorithm. So we're going to have a function in our code, which is called compute sectors. Um, I'm going to set up a new two dimensional array. So it's a grid, I just call grid is like a 2D array. It's going to have width, the same width as the map. The height of this 2D array is gonna be the same height as the map. And it's going to be initially filled with all zeros. Then I'm going to store a number called a sector number. Okay, and that is the number that we're going to be filling in to the locations on the map. So the ones, the twos, the threes. Then for each X in the map and for each Y in the map, so I'm going to go across and I'm going to go across. Um, what is the check that we had to do? Well, we had to say first, did that sector, did this state's X and Y location, did it already have a non-zero number? Well, if it already had a non-zero number, I don't need to do this computation, right? Also, for objects that are bigger, if, if we have things that can't fit, then if it can't fit there, there's no point in doing the, the, the search to, to compute connectivity because if something can't fit, it's obviously not connected to anything. So if it already has com been computed or it can't fit, just continue, ignore this one. That's the, remember when we were skipping over all of those ones? That's what we were doing on this line of code. So if it does have a zero and it can fit, let's increase the sector number. So now the zero goes to a one or the one goes to a two because we're computing a new region of the map. And then what we do is we just do a cardinal breadth first search outward from location X, Y, and as we encounter legal actions to zeroed locations, we assign them the sector number. So I'm not gonna give you the code for that because by now you know how to write a BFS, it's just a simple while loop, or you could write it in a, um, you could write this in a, a recursive fashion as well, but it's just that breadth first search that goes outward filling up the sector numbers. And then look at this, we're gonna have another function Sorry, I get, I get really excited about this because I'm excited that you get to do this. I wish that I could do this again for the first time because that's like, I really love this sort of thing and learning this for the first time was really exciting for me. So now we're going to have a function which is is connected, right? So we want to query if two points on the map are connected, point x1, y1 and point x2, y2. And maybe at the beginning of this lecture, you were thinking, well, in order to, to know if they're connected, we have to compute the path. But all we have to do now is we have to check the sector number of the first state and the sector number of the second state. And if those sectors numbers are the same, then we know they're connected. So just one more time, that last part, that means that if this, if we are checking like X, Y right here, versus x, y right here, this one is not the same as this three. And so this location is not connected to that location. All right. So that's something you have to do in this assignment. Um, and now we have, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, of, the, of this lecture, this is gonna be a longer one. 
I apologize, but it's going to really help you. Like, rather than just say, here's the assignment, go do it. I want to explain it as well as possible. And you can watch this lecture at like, if you're on YouTube, click double speed, right? So you can get all the info faster. But I want to give you more information because once again, there are no textbooks required and there's no additional reading required. Like the lectures are everything. So bear with me while I go over time for this assignment because Every extra slide that I give is a hundred questions I don't have to answer on Discord. All right. So the connectivity check, two tiles are connected if their pre-computed sector number is the same. That should be hopefully understandable by now. We can use this to pre-check to see if a path is possible before computing it. So if a start and a goal are not connected, then no path can exist between them. Let's look now at bigger object sizes, okay? So what we've looked at so far was objects of size one by one. However, we're doing objects of size two by two and three by three for this assignment as well. So let's look at three by three. Well, we've got this location here, this X, right? Is that connected to this location here? Yes, it is, why? Because an object of size three by three can move from that location to this location. However, it cannot move to that location. So let's just plot on our graph here where objects of size three by three can actually fit, right? So again, remember that this X means the top left of an object of size three by three. So there's no X right here because an object of size three by three would overlap this green tile. There is, an ob there is an X here because they can fit everywhere. So let me just, uh, I just moved something and I don't know what it is. Uh, let me move my camera back up. All right. So these X's represent where a three by three object can fit. So like they can fit here, they can fit here, they can fit here. Now intuitively, you can already see the, com the connected sectors of objects of size three by three, right? Because if we can breadth first search within these X's, we can assign them all the same values and then we can make our sector map for objects of size three. So let's go do the same thing we did before, but for object of size three, and it's actually the exact same algorithm. It's just the can fit is different. So we, we're starting up here in the top left. We do our breadth first search out from there. Okay. And then we actually end up with, with this. We end up still containing a bunch of zeros. So when we did one by one, a one by one object can obviously fit everywhere. And now what we have is a grid of mostly zeros because most places an object of size three by three can't fit. So that is your sector map for an object of size three by three. And again, you can tell like, is this location connected to this location for a size three by three, well, they have different values. So no, they're not connected. All right, speed optimizations. Now, we, we went over all of the basic functionality of assignment two. So up until this point, this is the stuff that you have to implement. I've explained all of it so far. However, there will be some speed optimizations that you can do um, in order to speed up your running time to try and get the fastest time in the class, because in this assignment, um, I'm gonna be like announcing the top three fastest solutions for both grad students and non-grad students, because I think it's really fun once you get the stuff working to see how fast you can make it. So let's look at some speed optimizations for this assignment. So the following optimizations will not affect the number of nodes generated but they will dramatically speed up the running time. So what this means is the things I'm about to show you, they don't affect the big O theoretical running time, but they do affect the practical in practice running the program running time. Okay. Um, someone mentioned Discord in the chat. So just really quickly again, Discord is only for students in the class. And if you're a student in the class, send me an email. I will send you a Discord invite. Uh, I'm not going to post it in the in the the Twitch chat or on YouTube because it's for students only. So none of these optimization optimizations are required for the assignment for getting full marks. However, they may be required to get really smooth, fast running code. Okay. 
So the first one we've sort of already talked about is that connectivity can show us legal actions, right? So after we compute connectivity, we know where the agent can move from a given state. So when checking to see if an action is legal, we can instead refer to the connectivity map. So it's legal to move to an adjacent state if they're in the same connectivity sector. So just look at this. What that means is once we have the connect connectivity sectors computed, if we want to compute the legal action, say from, um, let me get my pen up, from this location, all we have to do is loop through the actions and see if the number is the same. So that all, sorry, that's actually incorrect because this is not a legal, no, that's, that's wrong. That, I made that slide just before class and that's incorrect. Let's, uh, let's delete that. I made that right before I was teaching because I was like, why didn't I have that? Um, and that's the reason I didn't have it because it's not true. So ignore it. All right. Connectivity sector optimizations. <laughs> Sorry. You know, we're doing this live. So I apologize that I make some mistakes sometimes. Just ignore that last slide. For larger sized objects, we may have some tiles that have a zero value. This means that the object cannot fit. So by pre-computing these values, we can use them later instead of doing the full object size check to see if all of the underlying tiles have the same value. So what does that mean? Well, at some point in your legal action generation, you need to have this can fit function, right? So can an object of size three fit right here, for example? Well, it can fit right here, but it can't fit right here. And it turns out that our connectivity map, wherever we have a zero, means the object can't fit. And so later on, when I go to call can't fit, I can instead just use the connectivity numbers instead of having to make nine Boolean checks to see if all of these are the same as this one. Okay, see how that works? That's a little speed optimization that you can do. Legal action optimizations. I talked about this a little already. The rule of no jumping over diagonals gives us an interesting property. So the move of a diagonal XY is only legal if XY and YX are all are also legal and it holds for all objects. So this is what someone mentioned before, and I had this in the slides before, is that um, upright is only legal because the surrounding uh, actions are legal. So when you go to compute your diagonal actions, whether or not they're legal, you could use this if you want to. All right. And I, I gave this one before, so I won't go over it. So here's an is legal action optimization that you can do. The most commonly called function in assignment two is probably the is legal action function because it's called for all eight actions every time you expand a node. So every time you expand a node, you have to generate all its children and every child has eight legal actions. All right. So what we can do is use the pre-computed connectivity sectors to check for legal cardinal actions. And since actions are legal, even because they're only legal if the source and destination tiles are connected. So here's what this means visually. Let's say we're trying to figure out if the diagonal action AD is legal. So moving from A to D. Okay, we're trying to figure that out. Diagonal action AD is only legal if AB, BD, a, C, and C, D are also legal, right? So we have to be able to move from A to B and B to D and from A to C and C to D in order for A to D to be legal. All right. So that means A, B is legal if A and B are connected. And that's the same for all cardinal directions, up, down, left, and right. So A, B, B, D, a, C, and C, D are legal if each of A, B, C, and D are connected. So that means if A, B, C, and D are all connected, then A, D is legal. And connectivity is 
transitive. So if A and B are connected and B and D are connected, then that means A and D are connected. Okay? So if AB, AC, and AD are connected, then AD is legal. What that means in practice is when you go to implement is legal action, you can check to see if A, B, and C all have the same sector number. And if they all have the same sector number, then AD is legal. All right. So that's like, that's, it's just an optimization that you can do where your legal action computation actually ends up being um, easier because of that. Here is an even more crazy legal action optimization that you can use to really speed up things um, in your code. So our environment is static, okay? That means that our tiles will have the same legal actions for a given object size every time you visit them. What does that mean? It means what you could do is you can pre-compute all legal actions for all tiles and later just iterate over the legal actions rather than generating them. And this ends up in a ton of time being saved. So what does that look like in practice? So let's say we have this part of the environment where we have a green tile here and the rest are blue, right? So what I'm gonna do is for each tile on the map, I'm gonna go through once at the beginning, I'm gonna pre-compute all the actions that are legal and I'm gonna store them somehow so that later I can look them up. So from this tile right here, the only action that's legal is moving down. So zero one. From this tile, the actions that are legal are going up, right, down, and down right. Similarly, from here, the only option that's legal is going down. From here, I could go left, I could go up, I could go down, I could go down left. So what I've done here is I have another data structure for some pre-computation that pre-computes all the legal actions. And so when I go to generate child nodes, instead of looping over every legal act, every possible action, all eight actions, and checking to see if they're legal during the search, I can just look up which actions are legal for a given state and immediately just iterate over those. Okay, so you can see how this might save us a lot of time. This may, like, this single change might save you, like, it might make your code run eight times, 10 times faster. It's, it's really incredible. How, how this speeds up your stuff. Here is another optimization that, I mean, you could also use this for assignment one if you want to, because I'm giving it out sort of before assignment one is due, but you don't have to, but is a very important closed list optimization. So the closed list stores which states have been expanded. So it's, it should be a, a list of unique states, right? So that means that each state on the map will either be in the closed list or not be in the closed list. So what I could do is instead of storing a list of like all the different states in the closed list, I could instead store a two dimensional array, which is the same size as the map of true or falses, which denotes whether or not that state is in the closed list. So that means that closed list membership will now, now be constant time. So just imagine that I had another data structure like this, which was the same size as the map, which just had a true or a false in each cell stating whether or not this thing was in the closed list. And that ups, ends up being a huge optimization because imagine if you have a closed list with a hundred things in it, right? Right now, what you're doing is you're just iterating over the closed list and checking to see if this value is in it versus if you if you have this sort of, well, this ends up being a hash table, which we'll talk about in a later lecture. But if you have this hash table or dictionary type approach to a closed list, then your lookups are going to be much, much faster. Okay. Another optimization is for your open list. So we store an open list of nodes. And then what you want to do is you want to go through that open list of nodes in order to check to see which one has the minimum F value. So if you're using an array for the open list, you'll just have to iterate through them and find the minimum F value. So what I've done for the assignment is I've included, um, or I will include because it's not out yet, 
a binary heap data structure, which you can figure out how to use on your own. And if you do, then getting the minimum value from this priority queue binary heap will actually be much faster. So if you can figure out how that binary heap data structure works, go right ahead and, and use it. However, as the case for all of these optimizations, please do none of these optimizations until you get your tests to pass. So get everything working and then implement the op optimizations. That, that's what you have to do. All right. Here's what you're going to do for the grad students for 6980. And I know that, so an hour and 15 minutes has passed. So that's the traditional class time. I haven't even gotten to the code yet, but me going over the code is going to be much faster this time because it's going to have the same structure as assignment one. So that's not going to take too much time. Here is the extra work that the grad students have to do. So this is for 6980. It's bi-directional search. So, so far we've looked at finding a path from a start location to a goal, lo goal location. What about the other way around? Might it be faster sometimes if we look from the goal back to the start? Okay. What about both? What if we started looking from the start and the goal and met in the middle somewhere? Maybe that's interesting. So bi bi-directional search, it searches from the start to the goal and the goal to the start. And it's going to stop where the graphs intersect. So intuitively, we can visualize why binary search or bi binary, bi-directional search might save computation. So search algorithms, if you've seen our visualizations of the animated searches so far, they start from a state and work outward, right? Creating some sort of radius of expansion. So which has a larger total area? One circle with diameter D or two circles, each which with diameter D over two right? The diameters of these are the exponent in our time complexity. So if we have O to the B or big O of B to the power of D, we'd rather have two times O big O of B to the D over two. Okay. So here's what binary search or bi-directional, geez, I keep saying binary. Here's what bi-directional search looks like in the optimal case is that we have one smaller radius over here, and one smaller radius over here. And at some point they touch and we have our path. So if we look at this, we're going to have a start and a goal. Um, the sum of these circles is much less, or the, the sum of the rate of the area of these circles is much less than the sum, than the radius or Jesus, the area of the bigger circle is what I'm trying to say here. So for single search, there's one of these circles. It starts from the start and it ends at the goal. Um, so you've got this diameter D, you've got your path length, and this diameter D is approximately the distance from the start to the goal, right? Um, so for example here, uh, maybe you have 906 expansions and you have 3869 total path cost. However, if we instead did a search from uh, searches from both ways, then the sum of the closed list size might be much smaller than the size of one list. See what I'm saying? So that, that's why that's the theory behind bi-directional search. So you're going to need some algorithm modifications. And this is why this is the grad version of the course is because I'm not giving you the algorithm for this. You got to go do a little bit of research on bi-directional search and start and, and implement it how you want. So you may need to modify the algorithm. You might, let's say, for example, maybe you have two open and closed lists. Maybe you want to implement it that way. Um, maybe you have a single closed list and maybe you like expand one from this one or one from this one, one from this one, one for this one. Okay. And just be, be careful that the heuristic may be backwards from goal to the start. So you may have to modify that a little bit. Maybe you could just use one list. So add the start and the goal node to the open list and choose the minimum F value for a single open list. But you gotta be careful of the heuristic direction, et cetera. So what about the goal test condition? When do we actually say that we had a path that was formed? Is it when the closed lists intersect? Is it when the open lists intersect? Try them out, okay? Um, 
maybe for node expansion options, you're going to alternate alternate between uh, like the minimum F value from either of these lists or the minimum from a single. You maybe you have bounding strategies that could speed this up or whatever. But for 6980, what I want you to do is just find something. You don't necessarily have to produce the optimal path. I just want you to get bidirectional search working. So a path is working via bidirectional search. And if you get the optimal path and a fast path, that is great, all right? And if you want to um, go look at a bidirectional search demo, here is a link to that. And let me just paste that in the chat real quick. Copy link, here you go. This is a great visualization. I hope it still exists. It does. So over on uh, the right hand side, just let me show you here real quick. This is a website kind of similar to my own that does bi-directional search. Here we can, uh, I think I can put walls in here like this. Yes, I can. And then if I click bi-directional for A star and then say start search, you can see the bi-directional search is working here. All right, so you can see how they're expanding from the different open lists. And when they finally meet, bang, there's a path between them. So that's sort of the behavior that I want to see from your bi-directional search. It might not be exact, and they use a different coloring scheme, obviously, but that's the sort of behavior that I want to see from your bi-directional search. All right, so that's the 6980 version of this assignment. And now, hopefully quickly, <laughs> it's going to take a few minutes, of course, but let's just hop through the code because every minute that I spend here is infinitely fewer questions that I have to answer. But again, a lot of this stuff is um, stuff that we've already seen before, okay? So the assignment to code, again, you have a search student function, which you're going to receive, and the vast majority of your time is going to be spent in that search student function. All of your assignment code should be in this file, and you are not modifying any other file. So just like assignment one, and only one person from each group is going to be submitting this assignment and you just put both names on it. And that's the same for assignment two, or for assignment one and assignment two and every assignment in the course. What I have done here is I've given you some huge hints. And what I realize now from assignment one is that, uh, and please pay attention to, to this part specifically, is that a lot of you, and I take this for granted, because the hardest part about being a teacher is putting yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know the thing yet, right? So I, I have all this programming knowledge that I take for granted. And so, for example, a few people who came to me with help and who needed help on assignment one, what they had done through no fault of their own was they had just opened up the JavaScript file, typed in all the code that they thought would work, and only after they had typed in 100 lines of code did they even start testing, okay? And by that time, there are so many error messages and everything is broken that it's very difficult to actually know where your actual code is going wrong, right? So here, what I recommend is doing the assignment in this order, and after you've finished each of these bullet points, test somehow to see if that thing is working properly before you go on to the next thing. So here we're building a house. The house is the assignment. You've got to lay the foundation and then go around and stomp on the foundation to see if it's solid. Then you build a wall and you like look at the wall and shake it to make sure that wall is fine. And then maybe you get four walls eventually and then a roof and you pour some water on it to make sure there's no leaks. So that's what we're doing this time instead of just writing all of our code, okay? That's, that's something that I take for granted as someone who has done a lot of programming um, and a lot of people entering this, entering this course as a third year student, their previous assignments may have just been write this function or write this hello world or write this data structure. And this is the largest piece of code they've ever looked at, right? So let's go over this uh, piece by piece. So my recommended order is the following. First, you're going to construct the function which computes whether a given size agent can fit in a given XY location. Okay, that function will then be used by the compute sectors and is legal action function. So if we go down somewhere, there is a can fit function. And this is the function that I highly recommend doing first. Okay, so that'll tell you whether or not an object can fit 
um, of a given size can fit. And that size will either be one, two, or three. Alrighty. Now, the second thing you should do is complete the compute sectors algorithm using the four directional breadth first search as shown in the class slides. So down here, the compute sectors algorithm is right here. So that's the compute sectors algorithm. And if we go back to the slides, the compute sectors algorithm doo -doo -doo, is the one right here. Okay, so that's what you're gonna do. So you may need this extra function that you write, which is the cardinal BFS. You could also just write the, the BFS in here if you want, but it's gonna get kind of messy to do that inside of a double for loop. So that's the second thing you should do. And after you complete that second step, what you should find is that uh, you right click somewhere and the, the, the connectivity is, is working correctly, okay? Now, let me also, oh, sorry, what I should have done, let me go over the marking scheme for this really quickly first. So I'm going over the marking scheme now because uh, we have the same thing, code style, style readability, um, do the functions, do the right thing, is legal actions is working properly, so like diagonal moves can't uh, go over tiles uh, like we said. But the important thing here is I am marking size one computations differently from size two and size three. So please, I recommend do the entire assignment for just size one and then come back and add in sizes two and sizes three because you can get, you can pass the assignment just by doing size one. Okay. Now, if you want to, you can incorporate size two and size three from the get go just by like having uh, an array of two dimensional arrays and all that sort of thing, but try and get size one working first. Okay. And here's the marking scheme for that. So a star pathfinding for size one is worth 40% of the assignment for sizes two and three. That's only worth 25% of the assignment, right? Connectedness for size one is worth 15% connectedness for sizes two and three is worth 5%. So I've split it up because some people sometimes struggle with the multiple sizes. So make sure you're doing these uh, for the size one, get that working first, and then come back and think about how you would put in those extra computations for the different sizes. All right. So step three is what I just showed. Use the results of step two to complete the is connected function and test it with the GUI. So you do not even start um, anything else until you have this working properly. Okay. Now, what you might rightly say is, for example, how do I do this BFS without the is legal action function? What I recommend is you just have some other function which checks is legal action that may like it does all the can it uses can fit and and you compute the compute sectors algorithm portion with that other is legal action function. And I think you'll st you'll start to understand that once once you start it, uh, implementing the assignment. So now that the first three steps are done, do we start to do step four? And step four is computing, uh, the, completing the is legal action function, which will be used by the search iteration function. And the reason why you wait until now to do is legal action is because you can use the compute sectors computation to do legal action computation, which I showed you in the slides. After you do is legal action, then you do the start search, fu start search function. Then after start search, you want to complete the get open and get closed functions. And those should be the exact same as in assignment one. However, if you end up using this included binary heap data structure for your open list, your get open will have to be different. And if you implement, uh, where is it? This closed list optimization, where you're using a hash table or a dictionary for your closed list, then you will of course have a different solution for your get closed. Because get open and get closed still need to return the same list of states, okay? Then only after all that is done, you complete search iteration using a star with a heuristic of zero. 
and it should behave identically to uniform cost search. So before you do any of your heuristic functions, you're going to get A star working. And then you can test that by coming up here and you check the solution A star. Okay. So the solution A star, if you come down here and set the heuristic to zero, then this should look identical to uniform cost search, which it does. So you can implement your A star. So in your student A star, you do this, you select zero for the heuristic, and then you can test whether or not your A star is working correctly. If it looks the same as, um, uniform cost search with a heuristic of zero, then what you can do is come back and implement the estimate cost function. And that estimate cost function is where you implement these four, um, these four distances and the only one of these four distances, which should take you more than five seconds is the diagonal one, right? Cause I showed you how to do the rest of the ones. Then, uh, after all of that is done, 6980 is going to implement bi-directional search and, uh, 25% of search marks for 6980 is going to be bi-directional search. So now that we've explained how to do it, Please remove all of these comments before submitting. Remove all of my comments so we don't have to scroll so much. Um, so let's look at the just the new things which have changed inside Search Student that you will need to know for this assignment. We are almost done with this lecture, I promise. So this dot config is going to have um, this dot actions. That's still the same array of actions. However, if I've selected eight directions, then this.config.actions will have all eight actions. If I select four actions, then this.config.actions will only contain the four actions. So make sure that you are iterating over that particular array because that's where the user interface interacts with. This.config.action costs, that is an array which is the same length as the actions array which contains the costs of all the actions. So as you're iterating over I equals zero, I equals config dot actions I, action costs I is the cost of action I. So the action is stored in actions and the cost associated with, associated with the same index is stored in action I. Um, config dot heuristic is going to contain a string, which is diag card dist or zero. And that's what you'll use in your function. I'll about, I'm about to show that. And config dot bidirectional is going to be true or false, whether or not the grad students are implementing bidirectional search. Okay. Um, this dot size, that is the current size of the agent. So that's what you're using for your size and this dot max size. That is the maximum size of the agent. So you can use size um, whenever you need to refer to the size of the current agent. And this dot max size is the maximum size of the agent, which is going to be three. Uh, this dot in progress is there fine. Uh, you don't need this dot expanded if you don't want to. And the open list and the close list are just, um, they're set up as before. And then the constructor is going to call the compute sectors immediately. Okay. So as soon as the object is constructed, this dot compute sectors is called. So let's keep scrolling. We've got a similar start search function. So in start search, you're going to set up the open list. You're going to set up the closed list. You're going to reset the size and start search now has one additional parameter, which is the size, which is passed in by the user interface. And I've already done this for you, but you set this dot size equal to size. And here, if you're using the binary heap, that's where you would set up the binary heap for your open list. But again, please only try and use the binary heap if you've already gotten it to work with an array um, as the open list. Here is your estimate cost function. So this function estimates uh, the distance between xy and gx, gy. So I've already written this here for you and zero is already done, right? So if the, if the heuristic is zero, return zero. If it's dist, that's the Euclidean distance. If it's curd, that's the cardinal Manhattan distance. And if it's diag, that's the diagonal Manhattan distance. So you would just return them in those locations. Can fit, I already went over that. So that should be uh, obvious. Is connected. Um, so this needs to be changed, okay? Because right now this 
uh, is connected checks to see, okay, does an object living at x1, y1, is it connected to x2, y2 at a given size? And right now what you can see is all that it's returning is whether or not the grid cells are the same color, okay? So if I go back to the assignment and refresh it, so the student version is here now, if I right click, everything with the same color is being highlighted. And that's because it's not actually computing the sectors, it's just returning whether or not they're the same color. So you have to change is connected to use the computed sector values. All right, the is legal action function, you're going to um, say what I did in the slides for computing the legal action for that. And you can um, use the computed sectors uh, here uh, as, as I showed in the optimization section, if you want to. The compute sectors function, that's where you do all the code for your sector computation. And then you have the search iteration function, which I have given you complete pseudocode for in the slides right here. So this is your search iteration function plus any minor things that you may have to do. All right. Then down here, you have to get open. And remember, get open has to return a list of XY states, each in their own array. Same thing for get closed. And then down here, we have our new node class, which takes in X, Y, parent, action, G, H. And I think I may have actually reversed parent and action here. So just be careful of that. Um, I think in assignment one, I had action then parent, but here I have parent then action. And if that's not true, just, just have a look, make sure you're not using the same code as assignment one. All right, and there's the H, the G cost, and there's the H cost. So that is the code. And now that you're familiar with this, it doesn't take me an hour to explain what the code does, right? Um, now, the one thing I did want to go over really quickly is how you would implement like the computed sectors for different sizes, okay? So for example, let's say here in the start search, you're going to have this dot sectors equals whatever, right? So you're going to set up your this dot sectors. Now I, I want to say this because sometimes it's annoying to do this in, in JavaScript. All right. So what I would do is do something like for don't use any. So what you have to do here is create a two dimensional array, which is the same size as the level. Okay. And a lot of places online have these fancy one liner codes that use like, I don't know, like map reduce to create 2D arrays. Keep it simple. Do this with for loops until you get it to work. So for let like X equals zero, X is less than, uh, where is our environment size? What do we have there? We have grid, grid.width and grid.height. So I'm just showing you this because it's gonna be something that some people struggle with. This.grid.width, uh, X plus plus, then uh, for let Y equals zero, Y less than this.grid.height, y plus plus. All right. So what are we doing here? Well, for each, um, for each value through the x, we want to have like this dot sectors dot push a new array, right? So a two D array is just an array of arrays. See, see how that works. So we're starting out with a blank array. We're going to go across the x's in the horizontal direction. And then this dot sectors dot push a blank array means that we're going to have a blank, a number of blank arrays equal to the number of columns in our map. So now what we can do is now that we have this, we can say this dot sectors X dot push zero. And this is how I set up a two dimensional array of zeros. Now, you can, if you go online and you find something that's different that you like more, that's okay. But you know, keep it simple until you get it working. And I don't know, I haven't tested this. So this may not be completely right, but just make sure that you're doing this. Now I've seen in the past, people will do something like this where they say, let uh, zeros equal like 
zero 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 zero, and then they'll say this dot sector dot push zeros. However, what that does is it creates an array of pointers to this array. So if I change a value in this array, it will actually be in every single row of my matrix, of my grid. So when you're creating a 2D array, make sure you are not pushing back references to existing arrays. They have to be newly created arrays. Okay, so that having been said, how would you implement this for three different sizes? Well, you could have three different variables. So you could have like sectors one, sectors two, sectors three, or what you could do is you could just have a three dimensional array. Okay. So you, for, for here, you could say four, let S equal zero or let S equal, yeah, S equal zero S less than this dot max size S plus plus. And actually, I'm going to want this to be less than or equal to. Here, I'm going to say this.sectors.push. This is where I'm going to push a blank array. Okay. Now I'm going to have this inner loop that says this.sectors.s.push a blank array and this.sectors.sx.push a blank array. So now what I have is I have a three dimensional array. And somewhere in my code, I can refer to this dot sectors S X Y equals sector number for size S at location X Y. See how that works? So there's no difference between a 2D array and a 3D array other than it's an array of, array of arrays rather than just an array of arrays. So if you're wondering how you implement um, different sizes into this, then this is how you would do it. However, what I recommend first is getting the whole assignment working, just assuming everything is size one. And then when you have that done, you can come back maybe and implement this extra dimension on your connected sectors and maybe the extra dimension on your closed list hash table or whatever. Okay. So that's how you would go ahead and, and, and do this with, um, with different sizes and it's not too difficult, but some people haven't wrapped 3d arrays around their heads yet. So that's why I wanted to just briefly mention that. Uh, do you want, so I had a question here. Do you want us to write out what each function does its args and returns or would, sh should you remove that? Well, you certainly shouldn't write it down because I've already written it down, but I do recommend deleting that. Okay. We know what it does as, um, as the TA and as the prof. So you can delete all of that once you hand it in, just to make it a bit easier to scroll for us. And also all the stuff at the beginning, you can remove all of our comments. Okay. From the code. That's fine. So that's assignment two. I know that it sounds like a boatload of work, but once you get into it, I think you'll actually find it kind of fun. It's not just meaningless, busy work. It's something I think that will actually teach you that if you go to implement games or something in the future, you can use all of these implementations in like a real life setting and actually make your code a lot faster. Okay. So again, uh, the very last thing I'll say is that I will be giving out, uh, like on D2L, there's actually D2L awards that not a lot of people know of. And so you can print out this little certificate and it'll be like fastest running assignment two for 3,200. And I'll have one for 6,980 as well. And I'll go over, I'll go over the top three fastest running solutions, um, for each of the classes. All right. That is it for assignment two. You have, uh, let's go back here. You have 16 days to work on that. Without trying to be mean, if you come to me on October 13th and tell me you're having problems downloading the assignment zip file, I'm not going to help you. Okay. Start this assignment early and come to me once you have stuff done. Do not leave of any assignment you've ever had. Do not leave this until the last minute. Please start working on this one a little bit earlier than you normally would. Okay. That's it for me. Um, 
that's assignment two. It will be um, available by morning tomorrow, okay? So when you wake up tomorrow or when you go to click on that link tomorrow, the assignment will be there tomorrow. It just may not be there this evening, but that's fine. All right. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. See you next time.